Good morning. It's been a very noisy week in public life, from military salutes as leaders remember D-Day through to the fanfare and the protests surrounding President Trump's visit to London. But what was the quietest thing that happened in politics? It was, surely, Theresa May's departure as Conservative leader, done by letter, an almost hesitant, self-deprecatory cough of farewell. But this was also the starting pistol for the leadership race itself, a noisy contest of egos and policies designed to determine the next Prime Minister. Now, very few of us have any say in that choice, which is surprising, you may think, given how high the stakes are. But every one of us is deeply involved in what happens next. Michael Gove, one of the front runners, has had his past drug use splashed across the front pages of the newspapers. Will this damage him? And can he really stop Boris Johnson? He is with us this morning. But if he admits to the possibility of extending the Brexit date beyond October, another contender, Esther McVeigh, absolutely doesn't. What does she think the consequences of no deal would be? All the pundits seem to suggest that the Brexit party would win in the Peterborough by-election, but Labour held on and now has a new MP being accused by some of her colleagues of anti-Semitic views. Barry Gardner, the Shadow Trade Secretary, joins us to assess where all of this leaves his party. Reviewing the news for us this morning, Katie Balls, deputy political editor at The Spectator, and Pippa Creera, political editor at The Daily Mirror. But to start the programme proper, the news now with Victoria Fritz. Good morning. The Conservative leadership contender Michael Gove says he wants to replace VAT if he becomes Prime Minister, as he continues to face difficult questions about taking cocaine on several occasions two decades ago. Mr Gove, who will be appearing on this programme later, wants to introduce a lower, simpler sales tax. But this weekend, he's been fending off allegations of hypocrisy, having written an article in 1999 criticising middle-class drug users around the time at which he now admits to have taken cocaine. A woman has died after being struck by lightning while walking on a mountain range in the Scottish Highlands. The 55-year-old was hiking near Kinloch Leven when she was hit yesterday evening. Police Scotland said another woman in the same group was also injured. She is now in a stable condition in Fort William. Huge crowds of demonstrators are filling the streets of Hong Kong to protest against a proposed extradition law they fear could allow Chinese authorities to target political opponents in the territory. Now, opposition activists say sending suspected lawbreakers to face trial in mainland China would erase the judicial independence Hong Kong was guaranteed when Britain handed it back to Beijing more than two decades ago. Barcelona has finally issued a building permit for one of its most famous tourist attractions, 137 years after the first stone was laid. La Sagrada Familia was given a license on Friday, allowing it to continue building work until 2026. Now, it's unclear why the church, designed by the Spanish architect Antony Gaudí, did not have a building permit in the first place. The two British teams in the Women's World Cup are playing each other today. England versus Scotland kicks off at five o'clock in Nice. It's Scotland's very first appearance in the finals. They're coming off a five-game unbeaten run. England finished third in 2015 and arrive in France, this time as one of the favourites to lift the trophy. That is all from me. The next news bulletin for you on BBC One is at one o'clock. Back to you, Andrew. And today might be the day that women's football really captures the imagination of the whole country. But we are here above all to do politics and so do the front pages. Boris Johnson, that £39 billion is ours, he says on the front page of the Sunday Times, emerging from its front page like some kind of blonde Godzilla from the depths. Um, the Sunday Telegraph um, splashes with Michael Gove there, scrapping VAT, the story that you heard on the news, but of course he's facing much worse headlines as well. The Observer picks up from the Mail on Sunday, Gove is branded a hypocrite after admitting using cocaine. And there is the Mail on Sunday itself, Gove, drug hypocrite. He won't be enjoying that this morning. And finally, there's the Sunday Express, another front runner, Gove, Johnson 
and Hunt are the three front runners at the moment in terms of uh, Tory MPs who've supported them. And he says he's going to be Britain's deal maker and he's got announcements on housing as well. So let's start, um, Katie, with Boris Johnson. As I say, he suddenly emerges from the Sunday Times. Yes, so he's kept a fairly low profile, but that hasn't, has, yeah. <laughs> hasn't really stopped him being seen as the front runner. And I think at the moment, if you look across all the papers, we're going into the first week of parliamentary rounds when MPs are going to have to start deciding who they want. And it does look like it's Boris Johnson's to lose. Can I ask you about that? Because there is a very strong sense, as you suggest, of a Boris Johnson landslide beginning to gather momentum. And yet um, Adam Bolton, for instance, in the Sunday Times reminds us that very often, almost always, the front runner doesn't get it in the end. So the question is, what can possibly stop him? Or who can possibly stop him now? Well, we've heard for a long time about a Stop Boris campaign amongst the parliamentary party. And I think everyone's waiting for that to emerge. What's really helped Boris Johnson is the operation that recently has been Stop Rob. So Dominic Rob has emerged as someone lots of the Tory MPs, perhaps in the centre of the party, are more sceptical about, owing to his... Brexiteer credentials, the fact that he would prorogue Parliament. Mm. In this Sunday Times interview, what we're seeing Boris Johnson doing is laying out his pitch. And again, you are seeing this effort he's making, which is to say, look, I'm serious on Brexit. If need be, I will pursue a no-deal Brexit. But he's trying to cosy up to those MPs in his party who are sceptical about him by playing up his One Nation credentials. One Nation. I'm a soft, cuddly Tory. Yeah. Pippa, you've, you've re read that piece as well. What do you think yeah. we learn about Boris Johnson from it, if anything? Well, we I think before? the main thing I learn is that he's prepared to say what he needs to to get through to the media stage. And first of all, it's about convincing the MPs to back him so he gets down to that last two. Everybody knows he's a favourite amongst the Tory mm. members that then go on to pick the Prime Minister or the Tory leader. Um, and uh, what those MPs he needs to need to hear from him is that he's the only person that can um, save the country, mm. to use his words from Corbyn and Farage. However, he's doing this by promising to withhold the EU divorce bill, which, quite frankly, about half of it we ready will have is ready um, factored in up until 2020. And I think the Chancellor and told me um, the week before last on this programme that actually we had a legal obligation, their legal do. advice that almost all of this money we have to pay over and, anyway. And also the backstop, which the EU has made quite clear there'll be, have to be some form of a backstop for the, the controversial Irish border backstop. And even if we were to walk away with no deal, as Boris Johnson suggests, might have to remain on the table, um, if we ever then want to have a trading relationship with our biggest trading partner, the EU, which presumably we will at some point, the EU has made quite clear that those things at that point will have to come back onto the table. So mm. it's disingenuous, I think, to suggest that you could walk away and save all this money. Um, and, uh, and But Boris need, Johnson needs to do that to win over these particular MPs. And, and, and yet, Katie, um, if you're the Tory party, as it were, at the moment, you're looking at Nigel Farage and you're really worried about the rise of the Brexit party. There's a letter, I think, in the, in the Sunday Times I was noticing from a, clearly a Tory activist who says, in the end, in the end, now we need the lion that roars the loudest. And that is going to be the instinct that probably takes him over the line mm -hmm. as things yeah. stand. The Brexit party is helping Boris Johnson. And this week I chaired the One Nation hustings. How was that? Because you, you were in the room. None of the rest yeah. of us were. Yeah. <laughs> Managed to get a seat chairing there. And Boris Johnson was making this pitch. He told MPs, and I would say this as an audience, that are a little bit sceptical of Boris Johnson. The One Nation caucus, and mm. there are lots of Tories who would say they're One Nation, but the caucus is against a no-deal Brexit. And he said to them that he was the only candidate who could get Nigel Farage back in his box. Now, he got a lot of cheers, I think in part because he had some of his supporters in the room. But it seemed to land OK with the group. And again, I think it's partly because they see other candidates on the Brexit spectrum as, as more hard line. But there are also some Tory MPs who simply don't believe that Boris Johnson would take us through no deal, that at the end he'd suddenly yeah. go for a referendum or, or an extension or something. And, and, just in and I think you are seeing in all of the different papers lots of MPs, some cabinet ministers coming out for Boris Johnson. He's but got Chris slight, Grayling, he's slight, the, the coup. <laughs> the slight problem he has is he has Steve Baker, ERG Brexiteer, coming out for Boris Johnson. Mm. Now, what Steve Baker wants on Brexit is, I would say, different to what some of the, his other supporters mm -hmm. do. So right. how does Boris Johnson please them all? OK, that's more than enough of Boris Johnson. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Michael Gove. Uh, the Mail on... He's, he, I don't know if he had a deal with the Mail, but he'd certainly given an interview yeah. to the Mail yesterday and explaining his drug use and all the rest of it. 
and the book was serialized. And it felt, if not cozy, there was a sort of certain amount of mutual respect between the mail group and Michael Gove. He can't be feeling that after looking at the front page well, of the Mail on Sunday. Well, I think there was Sunday. a bit of a bidding war going on for Owen Bennett's book, his um, biography of, of Michael Gove. And uh, in these contests, uh, daily and Sunday versions of the same title are uh, on opposing sides often. Oh, so, um, so yes, yeah, so the, the Mail had this piece yesterday. And today, the, uh, the Mail on Sunday has really gone for the jugular and suggested that Michael Gove had hosted um, a party at which cocaine was used. Now, um, the line from Michael Gove, that's the wrong, that's the wrong phrase, isn't it? The, it is um, the wrong <laughs> phrase. Strike the, that out straight strike away. Strike that out straight away. But Michael Gove's response is that he doesn't actually remember, remember specifically the date about this. And I think really what this comes down to is whether or not um, somebody who then, then ends up... I mean, all politicians have pasts, don't they? All of us mm. have pasts. And particularly if you're, if you're very young and you don't necessarily recognise you're going into the, the sort of the, the top tier of government, um, you can't necessarily, necessarily be pr predict what's going to come. Um, and for some, that's running through wheat fields, and some that is apparently using cocaine. Mm. But I think the problem here is that, um, it, well, it seems from the outside, it, to many people, it will look like senior politicians are able to have one set of rules applying to them, whereas normal people wouldn't. So, for example, and a teacher would not be able to pursue their career if they admitted that they'd used cocaine, yet a man who was the education secretary was. Can, indeed. Um, and they, they reprint Michael Gove's article from 1999 there, and it is a characteristically ferocious, full-blooded attack on people who want to decriminalise drugs. Yeah. Um, and and I mean, he, he effectively calls himself a hypocrite in the piece, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, because he says that if you were going to change, if you're going to uh, uh, attempt to change the relaxed drug laws, really you'd be doing, you know, be lots of middle class politicians doing it out of guilt to try and excuse mm. their past demeanours. Um, this is obviously written in 1999, so this mm. is some yes. time ago. Um, but it's a charge which is, you know, it's, it's worrying for him because it, because the hypocrisy charge may stick. I think people are actually more concerned about that possibly than the drug taking of itself. And also, drug taking clearly, cocaine is not a victimless crime. I mean, there are no. people that feed these, um, that, that uh, feed are. the supply, and and uh, often it's young. Uh, black men uh, get caught up in lives of violence. So it's not quite, you know, Krista Dick, the, the um, Met Commissioner, as an example mm. of a senior politician, yeah. a policeman who said, yeah. policewoman that said that it's, uh, you know, it's certainly not victimless. Certainly not victimless. Um, let's talk about uh, Michael, the, the, the Michael Gove announcement that he wants to talk about today, I suspect, the Sunday Telegraph, the abolition of VAT. What's so bad about VAT? I mean, no one likes paying taxes, but yeah. this tax in particular. So we are seeing Go trying to move the conversation on. I don't think you can quite call this a dead cat, but it is the type of headline grabbing policy. And he's saying VAT is burdensome, it involves a lot of paperwork, and he wants to help ordinary people, small business owners, and to do that, he would rather have a lower sales tax. Now, I think there's also a motive here, which is because clearly VAT something that we have when we are in the EU. So Do you think it's just because it's European he's against it? I, I don't think that's the only reason. I think that when you're a Michael Gove and you're trying to pitch yourself as a pragmatic Brexiteer, and there are some who really say he is not very Brexit at all, given the fact he got behind the withdrawal agreement. This is the type of policy which I think has, has a, two, a few things going on. And I definitely think one of the things they're trying to confirm here is his Brexiteer credentials. Do any of us understand how a sales tax would be very different from this? Because I don't. Well, I think, it's, I think the point is that VAT is a fixed, it's a fixed level and a sales tax could be applied differently to uh, different products. So, for example, fuel could have a different sales tax. So the government from, can use it yeah, to change behaviour. Yeah, exactly. OK. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's, let's turn to Esther McVeigh, who's also on this show later on. She is marketing herself, as it were, effectively to the right of Dominic Raab yes, when it comes to Brexit. The most hard line of the Brexiteer Tory leadership candidates and seems here to be outflanking Dominic Raab. And the key point in this piece is that she has also said that she would indicate that she'd be prepared to shut down Parliament in order to stop MPs supporting a no-deal no deal Brexit, mm. which, of course, Dominic Raab suggested that he would keep on the table last week and caused huge, out, huge outrage uh, and uh, accusations about uh, constitutional improprieties causing chaos, dragging the Queen into it. Um, and actually, you know, I think there's a lot of people that felt that to take such a hardline position um, was really not the sort of thing uh, that a, a democracy should be doing, particularly well, one can, which can, launched a campaign on taking back control and having sovereign, you know, having more sovereignty and power of our own parliament. We can ask her about that very shortly. Um, well, let's be fair to the, to the other front runner, who, who's Jeremy Hunt. Um, he's all over the front page of the Express, yes. saying that he'd be a bit... Everyone's saying, I'm the deal-maker. I can do a deal that other mm. people can't. And we effectively just have to take this on trust, don't we? Yeah, I mean, I think the pitch really is... It does seem at the moment that, barring a disaster, and like you say, the front-runner does have problems, Boris Johnson is 
on course for a place in the final two. Now, what the other candidates have to do is to show and prove to their colleagues that they are the candidate who can deliver a Brexit deal without triggering a general election. Mm -hmm. And I think the Peterborough by-election has really raised the premium on being able to fulfil that pledge. I think if you look at the men on Sunday, we have a situation where Sajid Javid, who I think his campaign didn't get off to the fastest start. He struggled to get in the conversation at points. Um, could have a game-changing endorsement. Ruth Davidson, Scottish Conservatives leader, is coming out for Sajid Javid. Now, there are lots of Tory MPs who want Ruth Davidson to be in the race. They think that she would be a good leader. But it follows that they will take seriously who she says is the person that she thinks is best placed to represent the party and move mm -hmm. it forward. But it is very much Jeremy Hunt, Michael Gove and Boris Johnson as the three front runners. At the moment. At the moment. At the moment. Now, but but it is, the process is, is going to be pretty short. We're going to know in a couple of weeks who the final two are that go to that go to the Tory membership. And Hunt desperately is trying to show that he is the one, you know, citing his business yeah. credentials, the fact that he set up his own business. I think the EU is interesting because they have said throughout that they're not going to reopen mm. the withdrawal agreement. But there's been some indications from Brussels over the last week that they might try they might try and do things like, rather than looking yeah. at the backstop as a as a, as a slab of marble will sort of mm. you know, shave off bits of it as they proceed and could look again at a Northern Ireland only backstop. And in, and in terms of the way this contest plays out, uh, Katie, you were chairing a private debate between them, but there's been an argument going on at the moment about the BBC holding a public debate on the 18th. Yeah. Boris Johnson is indicating in that piece that he may not turn up himself. Mm. I don't think you could call it 100% yes from Boris Johnson right now. I think when you look at the leadership campaigns, there are some who worry that a debate with lots of different candidates could turn into blue-on-blue -blue warfare, which could then be it's weaponized. That anyway, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. At, the same, but, sorry, at yeah. the same time, presumably, the rest of us need to see them yeah. tested. You because know, this, is a, know. This, this is 160,000 Conservative members who are picking our next Prime Minister, and I think there's a lot of people that very, feel very awkward about that. It is a deliberate strategy from the Johnson campaign not to have him doing media interviews, broadcast media interviews, only to do newspaper because they think they can control it better. You contrast his campaign this time with his campaign two years okay. ago, which quite frankly yeah. was shambolic, okay. and they, so need to keep their man, they need to keep their man yeah. um, under wraps. I mean, there are two audiences, and ultimately the public have to have this person as Prime Minister, which I think is why it is important they do do debate. Well, as long as he comes on this show, I don't really <laughs> care very much. Thanks very much indeed. We've covered the entire round. And so to the weather, wild and blustery winds, eye-scorchingly bright sunlight, then black thunderstorms, a tumble of confusion. It's almost as if Twitter had infiltrated the planet's meteorological system. Louise Lear has more details on that. Louise. Well, I tell you what, Andrew, you've probably summed up our week ahead in actual fact. So I'm going to start off with the calm. Beautiful morning in Norfolk. Lots of blue sky and sunshine enjoying the prolific poppies here. Hardly a cloud in the sky across much of England and Wales. We've got some cloud further north and west. That's been producing some showers in Scotland and Northern Ireland and the p potential for a few sharp showers to develop across the southwest of England and Wales as we go through the day. Sunshine turning increasingly hazy in the southeast, but generally speaking, a good deal of dry weather with some sunshine continuing and with lighter winds than yesterday, a degree or so warmer as well. So highest values this afternoon of 20 Celsius, 68 Fahrenheit. I hope you can make the most of it because things will change, particularly for England and Wales. Overnight tonight and into tomorrow, we're likely to see a spell of particularly wet weather moving its way across southeast England and eastern England through the day on Monday. Not great timing for the early morning rush hour. That's going to push its way steadily west and ahead of it we'll see a few sharp showers as well. A few showers further north and west but the best of the sunshine uh, is likely to be across western Scotland in a little more shelter here. We could see highest values of 18 degrees. Feeling bitterly cold and disappointing in the cloud and rain only 13 or 14. So certainly worth bearing in mind if you're up and off early keep abreast of the forecast. Tune into your BBC local radio. Some of that rain could be particularly nasty. Back to you Andrew. Many thanks for that. Now, Esther McVeigh is one of the more unusual Conservatives seeking to be our next Prime Minister. She didn't go to Oxford or private school. The former Work and Pension Secretary is a working-class star of the Tory right who plans to take us out of the EU with a no-deal exit later this year, and she's with me now. Do you think, Esther McVeigh, that it makes a difference um, that you have a very different background? You didn't go to Eton and all the rest of it. How would it feel different to have a woman of your background leading the Conservative Party? 
Well, our party is a broad church. It always has been. It's about uh, meritocracy. Uh, and for me, our party is also about social mobility. It's about anybody can come from anywhere and achieve the highest post in the land, so long as they are prepared to work hard enough, so long as they can get a good team together, and so long as you've got a vision that reaches out to the country. And that's why I'm traveling the country all the time um, as part of a pub road show with blue collar conservatives to really hear what people want us to do once we've delivered Brexit, what do they want after that? Yeah. And they want money in schools, they want money going to police, and they also, which I've announced today, is the public sector pay guarantee, because people want to know that they're going to have a fair crack at okay. the whip too. But we're not there yet, we're not out of the EU yet, and your position on that is essentially that there's not going to be another negotiation, they're not really going to negotiate, so we have to be prepared to leave at the end of October with no deal if necessary. Mm. So I'm being very honest about, A, what's happened to that withdrawal agreement. It was absolutely uh, defeated uh, in the House. So the House don't want it, MPs don't want it. In the country, in the EU elections that we saw, people do not want that withdrawal agreement. So now we've got to say, no, no bits of tweaking is going to get that withdrawal agreement right. And equally, when Theresa May got the extension to the 31st of October, they'd said, we're not with opening that withdrawal yeah. agreement. And on top of that, so I think other candidates have got to be really honest, Okay. To get this through by the 31st of October, if that is key to you, you couldn't even get an act through on the floor of the House. So what I'm saying is actually what is possible. Let's come, come on to that in more detail. But to be absolutely clear, your policy feels to me almost identical to Nigel Farage's policy. Is there any real difference between you and Nigel Farage about how we get out on the 31st of October? Well, I know what I'm saying. I don't necessarily know what he's necessarily what saying, saying, but exactly I'm the same. saying... There's no difference. I'm saying we want a free trade agreement. Yeah. I'm saying no deal is back on the table so because anybody who's done any negotiations knew as soon as the Prime Minister took no deal mm. off the table, you'd ruined your negotiation time. So I'm looking for what's the best for the country and with a free trade agreement. That is exactly the same policy as the Brexit party. You've called Nigel Farage a tour de force. You've been quite warm towards him compared to other Conservatives. Would you work with him? He wants to be part of this process. He wants to be part of the negotiation. If you win this campaign, if you become Prime Minister, do you open the door to Nigel Farage? What I would be doing was delivering Brexit. Yeah. So we don't yes or need... No. Sorry, do you open the door to Nigel Farage? Listen. We don't need a Brexit party once we've delivered Brexit. The whole reason this but campaign this... came about is because we never got out of the EU on the 29th of March. Mm. So one step at a time, and what I will do is no negotiations because we need to be out on the 31st of October. You've also said that if you become Prime Minister, your cabinet, for that period at least, would not include Remainers. So can we be clear, you get rid of the Chancellor of the Exchequer, you get rid of the Foreign Secretary, you get rid of the current Brexit Secretary, you get rid of, I think about 20 of the current Cabinet are Remainers, so you clear them all out. So, so this is what I said, there's a limited time until the 31st of October and what we've got to make sure that the Cabinet believes in leaving on the 31st of October. Now if they voted Remain but now believe they in leading... Stay on the leaving on the 31st of October because what we don't want because there's hardly any time there I can't have people saying this isn't what we want to do you can't have people resigning sure. you've now got to work together to make sure we get out and then once we've got out okay. anybody can be in the cabinet because then we go back to conservative values to right. deliver our promises to so, the country. So you become Prime Minister there's quite a clearing out of the current cabinet you then sit down with your new cabinet presumably including people from the ERG and so forth you sit down with Sir Mark Sedwell who's the cabinet secretary and he presumably sells you what he told Theresa May in his leaked letter and he says no deal would mean food prices going up by 10 percent, our national security being disrupted, Britain becoming less safe, many many businesses having to be bailed out, direct rule in Northern Ireland and the stability of the union would be in jeopardy. That's what your cabinet secretary says. Do you get rid of him as well? Well, uh, he's got two jobs at the moment. Uh, maybe he needs to spend a little bit more time on the Cabinet uh, Secretary too. But actually, I like Mark Sedwell. Uh, and, but what we need to say is, look, what we're doing now, let's look at it from a different way, because a lot of these people were Remainers. What we're not trying to do is hold on to a relationship mm. we had in the past. Yeah. But we've got to be good friends in the past. We've got to move forward. We've got $39 billion back on the table. We we've don't got have it no back. deal I'm sorry back to interrupt you about that. We don't have it back on the table because the legal advice to the government is absolutely clear that most of that money is money that we legally owe. 
Uh, no, if you look at the House of Lords uh, financial report on that, it might be about nine billion that is owed if we went to international courts and well, the rest is not. The, the Chancellor so, disagrees, uh, and I, he, the Treasury says it's more like twenty-five billion and probably higher. No, and, that, and he says that is clear legal advice to the government. And, and that is because if you were paying to remain in for the implementation period, which we know we'd be paying about mm. ten billion a year, so. If we are staying in for uh, two years, then he's quite right. We are paying that extra money, you're right. But if we don't, if we come out, that would be ours. So okay. we'd work well with Mark Sedwill and say, look, okay. we so, know we are on a better position right, because let's, let's, we need a good relationship with the EU. Okay, and that means that, that let me they ask would you, be in a okay. far worse position let me on ask tariffs you, than we would if they had to well, pay for let, them. Let me ask you about something else that you've mentioned yourself, which is the role of Parliament in all of this. Mm -hmm. Parliament is very likely to vote down any government taking us towards no deal. That's where they are at the moment. Would you suspend Parliament during sort of late September and October in order to get out with no deal if you had to? That, would, uh, that wouldn't be my priority. I wouldn't be looking to do that, no. But if you had but, to, would but, you? But, but what I've said, hang on a sec, Andrew. What I've said is we'd use all the tools at our disposal because what but we have seen... that includes proroguing Parliament, on, doesn't it? What we have seen by MPs going against the democratic vote of the country. They have torn up 400 years of history. They've ripped up the rule book. So it seems somewhat wrong to me that people wanting okay. to frustrate the vote can rip up the rule book, yet should I mm. want to use any tools at my disposal, I would be okay, uh, that, that is, seen that, that as is clear. incorrect you... when I'm helping ensure the democratic vote of the people. But, can you but, see but, can but, a conflict but, of pro, thought pro, in that process? Prorog proroguing parliament and the dates of the Queen's speech and so forth is something that has to be agreed between the Queen and the Privy Council. So to be clear, as Prime Minister, you would be prepared to go to the Queen and say, I don't want Parliament to sit for this period for these reasons. Andrew, did you see the hypocrisy between no, people saying about, that asking, they would rip I'm up asking the about rule what you would actually and do. I would just be using the laws. And so, as I've said I'm to you clearly... I'm asking what you would do as Prime Minister. There's the Queen sitting there. You have to persuade the Queen to, pro, uh, to, to stop Parliament sitting during a period. Do you ask her to do that or not? And I've been clear to you that I wouldn't be looking to do that. All I was pointing out was the hypocrisy of people wanting to frustrate the So you're not answering my question. My answer, it's and a very I, clear question. Well, if you're Prime Minister, do you, A, consider the possibility of suspending Parliament during that period? And if the answer, as I think, is yes, do you accept that you then have to sit in front of the Queen and say, don't allow Parliament to sit during October? And that is bringing the monarch absolutely into what would be a ferocious political Andrew, controversy. Andrew, I said I'd use every tool at my disposal. So that would include that. I'm saying it, it would. wouldn't be my priority and I wouldn't be looking to do that. But like I said, people frustrating the vote ripped up 400 years of rules. I personally would be using what were in my tools, as it were, my toolkit. I think there's a big difference. But if, you're too, if you open your toolkit and that involves dragging the monarch right into political controversy, you'd be prepared to do that? I wouldn't be looking to do that. You wouldn't be looking to do it, but you'd be prepared because to. Because I am a Democrat and I believe well, I in that is the clear. democracy okay. of the country. And I do want that to be clear because I'm standing up for the people who won the Democratic vote. Let's, let's move on to some of your other policies. Um, mm. You want to spend a lot of money um, improving public wages in this country. Where does it come from? Well, what we've looked at that, because I believe, and this is a guarantee, that people would get mm. either the highest, whether it was inflation or whether it was their pay review body uh, amount. And I'd said, I believe when we leave the EU, there will be a growth. I do believe with free trade agreements, we will be growing this economy, which the Conservative government's already done. But if that weren't the case, and people like you don't believe that is the case, there is oh, money put believe. aside. Uh, you don't there know is what I money. Believe. Well, what do you believe? I'm, 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 I'm work for the BBC. I, I don't ever talk about my okay, beliefs. Okay, you don't have a, a view on it. Okay, uh, so um, I would guarantee that money because a, as we know, Philip Hammond has already said he squirrelled away, uh, coming up to twenty-six billion mm. pounds. So there's money there, or the £39 okay. billion, if we didn't pay it in its entirety, we'd have that. And it would roughly cost two point, or up to £2.3 billion a year. And this so is we money that would go to, to nurses, it. school yes. teachers, the police and so forth. Yeah. As a Home Secretary, would you be tough on drugs? Uh, we would keep to being tough on drugs as we have been, yes. Have you ever used Class A drugs yourself? No, I haven't. Do you think that somebody who has admitted to using Class A drugs is fit to be Prime Minister? And if you're alluding to uh, Michael Gove on that, I hope people will actually judge him by how good he's been as a politician. So I 
do believe he mm. can. He said okay. it was something he did 30 years ago, and he's um, he regrets. regrets it. Mm. Uh, David Gork, who's the Justice Secretary in the government, says this. There's a responsibility for middle-class people that take cocaine to the dinner party, that when they see the story of a 15-year-old boy stabbed in East London, they should feel a degree of guilt and responsibility. Do you agree with that? What I am saying is I want to support police to do a job they can do. So I've pledged three billion now to police. I'm going to halve foreign aid to give four billion to schools, three billion to police, and I'm going to make sure that we have a public well, sector pay guarantee. So I want to make sure that people who are up to £50,000 in the public sector, that actually we support them. Because you know what? Between 2010 to 2017, they have helped get this country back on its feet. Now, now say, we've got to say thank you, you about a change and give your, them a pay increase. There's a change in your policy in that, isn't there? Because you say the money is going to come from the foreign aid budget. The foreign aid budget is set by law at 7%. Oh, 0.7. 0.7, I beg your pardon. And you voted for that and spoke for that when it was put into law. But what you so want, now you want to change it and unpick all it. All you have to do, if you want to change that, and obviously these are two separate agreements, so the other one is foreign aid, which is doubled from 2010 to 2019, where we are now, whereas other budgets have either been frozen or cut. All you have to do to reduce that foreign aid budget is actually make a statement on the floor of the House of why you haven't spent that money. And that's what you need to do. And so that's you, you why would take it from the foreign it. aid budget. Um, when, yes. you, when you were but in... keep the foreign aid budget at high levels, at 2010 okay. levels, so we'd still be supporting okay. when, when you When you were at work and pensions and in charge of universal credit, mm -hmm. you said there was no link between that and more people going to food banks. Your successor, Amber Rudd, has absolutely contradicted you on that. Um, do you now regret what you said? Do you accept there is a link between the way that universal credit was, ro was rolled out and people going to food banks? Well, what you've seen right across the globe is people going to food oh. banks. And it but has I'm talking gone about up. Britain. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm saying across the globe it's gone up. And our lives are complicated. And actually, if you look into the reports of why people go to food banks, it's very, very complicated. And some of them could have been, um, you know, they didn't have money. Some of them have been because they've been uh, had addiction. Some of them have but been because they've been in difficult. But universal credit had a particularly harsh effect on people in this country. I'm asking, is there any aspect of that that you now regret? Hmm. So what I did in the harshest aspects of universal credit I actually wasn't in Parliament for and that was George Bos Osborne's 12 billion extra cuts which mm. Amber would have voted for. Now what I did when I came back to be in charge of that was department was to get okay. back most of that money that George Osborne took back and do you know what I got that money back because I went to cabinet and I explained mm. clearly those cuts were too harsh they were going to hurt people mm. and we needed that money back in the department. And I was the only Secretary okay, of State who final, got money back. Okay. So I actually have reversed final, those changes. Final question. The BBC is hosting debates for all the leadership challenges on the 18th. Will you be there? If I'm still in, yes, I will. Esther McVeigh, thanks very much indeed for talking to us. Now Thank then, you. huge sighs of relief in the Labour Party after, in a tight squeeze contest, they held off the Brexit Party to hold Peterborough in this week's by-election. But old rows over anti-Semitism and another referendum haven't gone away. Barry Gardner, Labour's Shadow International Trade Secretary, is here. Barry Gardner, a great relief, I'm sure, for the party at Peterborough. But nonetheless, you get a new MP who, immediately she's elected, other Labour MPs, your colleagues, are calling to be suspended because she liked what was an anti-Semitic tweet. Andrew, I, I found myself uh, scrolling through tweets yesterday and by mistake I liked a, a tweet of one of my colleagues, which I immediately unliked, actually. Um, well, but... Look, the, the point that you're, you're making, um, I, I take it on board. She has apologised. She said that this was a, a, a careless error. She looked at, at the video of the children um, supporting uh, the, the people who had suffered in New Zealand, um, and she didn't bother to read that. Uh, what it was went pretty with clear. It. Zionist yes, slave well, master's if, agenda. If she'd read it, I'm sure it would have been, mm. um, but she said she didn't. The point, the point is this. Uh, Lisa Forbes will be dealt with in in the same way as anybody else in, in our party. If there's a complaint made against them, and you're telling me that there is, then it will be handled mm. in exactly the same way as a complaint against anybody else. Uh, I'm not part of that process, mm. but we have a robust process, and it will take place. All across Britain, there are people who use social media and don't find themselves liking anti-Semitic tweets, and yet the Labour Party doesn't seem to be able to get those people into candidacies, and you choose the ones who do. There is a problem here, is there not? Well, I'm, look... Um, let me simply say this. Uh, she has apologised. 
I think that um, she has said that she's committed to, to fighting against anti-Semitism, to working with the Jewish community to ensure that, that they are confident uh, that she is not anti-Semitic. Um, and, and that is something that she must now okay. deliver on. Um, but on a day when you know you are you're going to be interviewing Michael Gove who's asking to be forgiven uh, for uh, class A drug use um, I think if, if he can be forgiven for that then Lisa Forbes can be forgiven for liking a tweet okay. that she didn't well, bother to read so right. in, in that perspective Lesson, let's move read on read tweets before and, you and, like and them. before you um, before you ask me no I have never taken any illegal drugs I haven't snorted or right. smoked okay. or, or popped the pills or injected well, anything so I, I guess I'm not even eligible to stand for leadership of the Conservative Party well let's let's talk about Brexit which is the other issue that comes out of this by-election given what where we are now given how long we've got and looking at what Conservative leadership candidates yeah. are saying do you back an extension to our membership of the EU beyond the 31st of October to get a deal look I, I, I think we do have to now move on uh, it's clear Sorry, that the move yeah, on beyond uh, well, an extension no let, let, let me explain um, we have tried our best it was the government's job to try and secure the referendum result and to mm. get a deal and, and to make sure that we left the EU. Um, they failed to do that through their own incompetence and, and the intransigence of the red lines that they laid down. We have then tried to, to work conscientiously in the cause of democracy. We were remain and reform was our original position. But because the referendum result, we have tried diligently to work with the government to get a compromise deal that would be acceptable, that would leave the European Union, but would be acceptable to the broad majority within Parliament and would get through. Again, the government's obstinacy and red lines precluded us from doing so that. So where does that leave so you now? Exactly. So now, we are now in the position where our party conference set out very clearly mm. that if we could not get a deal, if we were fated that was acceptable, if we were facing a, a disastrous no deal situation, then we would do everything we could to stop that. And that means a second public vote, either through a general election ah. or through a second referendum. So you are now That's our party conference position and the events of the, of the past months where, where yeah. Theresa May has gone beyond the original deadline, failed because of her own intransigence to negotiate an acceptable mm. deal with so, us, so we're now in that position. To be absolutely clear, the official Labour Party position now is for a second referendum. It's, it's exactly the same as it was at the party conference, which is that if we mm. could not get that, then of course we would oppose no deal and we would, we would look either for a public vote or indeed for a general election to do that. And I, I, I mean, I can think I, it's I, actually... I'm interested you can't just say yes when I say, is the policy now for a, for a second referendum? Because almost everybody at the top of your party thinks that now. Yes, Tom uh, Watson thinks the deputy leader, shadow chancellor John McDonnell thinks sorry. the leaders in Scotland and Wales think it, you know, transport secretary thinks it, the Brexit secretary thinks it's almost everybody seems to agree that a second referendum at the top of the Labour Party is now necessary with one notable exception and you know who I mean Jeremy Corbyn on Friday we are not at the stage yet where Parliament's actually voted on another referendum I think it would be much better if there was actually a general election now we know he wants a general election we know you want a general election but that ball is not in your court well actually you've got it entirely the wrong way around because you know you know very well that the, the whole mechanism of Parliament means that we have, as the opposition, no power to deliver a second referendum. And the Conservative... Or an election. So, sorry, that's where you're wrong, because, of course, what we do have is we have one power that could actually force the government, and that is to, to, yeah. to call for a motion of no confidence in the government. But you and only win we, it if you have Tory votes. Yes, indeed. Uh, and, mm. we, and we might be able to... Certain Tories have said that they would actually, in the circumstance of a no deal, support a motion of no confidence in the government. The point is this, that so, in order to get a second referendum, the government would have to introduce legislation and the government have made it clear that they don't want to do that. 
We could yeah. force their hand for a general election because we can introduce that. We have the power to introduce that motion of no confidence. So I'm very happy to go for a second referendum. And I've told you if the government is going to do that, I, I would be delighted. But you just um, don't think it's going to happen. Can I just come I, I, back to where that, we started so on this? So that's which exactly is... the point, And that is exactly why Jeremy let, said let, okay. that he, would, he thinks that the way forward right, would be a You've explained that very election. clearly. Let me come back to where we started, however, which is as things stand, we are heading to leave the EU on the 31st of October, quite possibly without a deal. What I want to know is what is the Labour Party's policy about an extension beyond the 31st of October, if it's a no deal otherwise? If, if we cannot secure a public vote, either in a general election or in a second referendum, um, then of course we would not want to crash out on no deal and we would want to extend. But that's not the point. What we want to avoid is a no deal. But an extension is entirely possible from your it's, point of it's view. It's one way of avoiding One way of avoiding that. Yeah. Can I ask you about another issue? Yeah. Um, at what point, a little more specifically, do you think this country should be carbon neutral? Um, well, the Committee on Climate Change has made it very clear that it should be carbon, uh, zero carbon. That's not just carbon neutral, that is zero carbon. And it includes international mm -hmm. aviation emissions and shipping emissions. And it must be that by 2050. That's, that's what the, the report that they've just produced right. sets that out very, very clearly. The Chancellor has said in a leaked letter that would cost a trillion pounds to achieve, and clearly that is money that would, wouldn't be going into schools and hospitals and so forth because you can't spend the same money twice. That's a huge choice for the country. Which way does the Labour Party fall? Going for that target, yes or no? Uh, yes. Yes, uh, OK. Right. And, but, We're out but, of time now, I'm afraid, but... A, ye a yes will do us very well. Well, it, it's important to explain that the Chancellor's okay. figures are wrong and well, also that the Committee on Climate Change has said that the, this new target can be achieved okay. within the same cost envelope as right. the previous one. Right. The Chancellor was wanting okay. to take the benefits right. of that and right. secure them for himself. Barry he Gardner, can't. thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Now, the BBC, as I've mentioned already, will be hosting a special live debate with the candidates who are still in the race to be the next Prime Minister on Tuesday the 18th of June and it's going to be shown here on BBC One at 8pm. If you'd like to ask the candidates a question live on air then you can email have your say at bbc.co.uk with your name and contact number. Your question should be open to all the contenders not to a specific politician. Michael Gove's pitch for the top job is that he's a convinced Brexiteer, a leading light of the referendum campaign, but also a sophisticated negotiator who wants to avoid a no-deal exit. Now, this morning, there are certain <clears throat> other issues hanging over his campaign, but we're going to start by asking the Environment Secretary about his Brexit campaign, and he's with me now. Now, last time round when you were standing for Prime Minister, it didn't end terribly well. What's different this time round? Well, I'm ready now, ready to be Prime Minister on day one. I have the experience in three senior uh, government offices of delivering, delivering sometimes against the odds and delivering with a sense of pace and urgency. And I've outlined a clear Brexit plan, I think the clearest and most comprehensive of any of the candidates, well, in order to secure a good deal that honours the referendum result. Well, let's talk about that plan. Under Michael Gove, when will we leave the EU? At the earliest possible opportunity. I've outlined well, what does a way. That mean? Uh, it means that I would have a smart negotiating team led by myself and other politicians rather than officials explaining to the European Union mm. what needs to change in order to make sure that we honour the referendum result. We would have no. a full stop to the backstop. We would also have a clear approach to making sure that we had a Canada-style free trade agreement. I'm going to come, I'm coming to come to details later on, but almost every other candidate is very clear that we will leave come hell or high water on the 31st of October. You have been rather different. You've said if it's going to stop us getting the deal we want, we would delay beyond that date. And you've allegedly told colleagues that you could delay until the end of next year. Is that true? I, I wouldn't delay until the end of next year, but I think there is a clear so, choice so here. So how long would you delay There's for? a clear choice here. Um, if we're on the cusp of a good deal, yeah. if we're making progress, which I believe we will in our negotiations, we're 95% of the way there on October the 31st. Would it really make sense to, to junk that progress and to say, tell you what, we're leaving without a deal anyway? I'm very worried that if any Prime Minister did that, that the House of Commons would say, well, we're on course for a deal. Now you're going for no deal. We don't have confidence in your government. And that government losing a vote of confidence would precipitate a general election, and we could have Jeremy Corbyn in Downing Street by Christmas. What do you I say, think that okay. is an irresponsible risk. We must deliver Brexit, 
before the next general election because we must stop okay. Jeremy Corbyn and Nicola Sturgeon in number 10 Downing so Street before ruining this country. Before 2022 is your absolute deadline. Uh, the, uh, my view is that we should leave before October the 31st, but if we need a few extra days okay. or weeks in order to dot the I's and cross the T's to get us out of the European okay. Union, that is the right thing. We cannot take Gove, the could, risk. Could we, we cannot take the risk, Andrew, of not delivering Brexit before the general election, because the real danger to our future and our prosperity is Jeremy Corbyn. But the general election isn't until 2022. I'm asking you, could, under Michael Gove, we still be in the EU early next year? No, we want to make sure that so we get out... So it will be definitely this year. We want to make sure that we get out at the earliest possible opportunity. And the real danger, but, but as uh, you, you those say... Those are that, words that don't help in a sense, well, the earliest possible opportunity. Yeah, well, what I've does been, that mean? I've been clear, weeks or days after October the 31st, if we're on the cusp of a deal. But the other thing is, you say that there won't be a general election until 2022. We've heard from Barry Gardner about the desire of the Labour Party to trigger a vote of confidence if we face mm. no deal. In those circumstances, there is a real risk, which nobody can discount, that we would lose that vote of confidence and whoever ah. is leading the Conservative Party, whoever is leading the Conservative Party in a general election before we deliver Brexit would lose. It is not enough simply to believe in Brexit. So what, you have got okay. to be able to deliver it. So what do you say to your colleagues who say, well, there's an obvious answer to this problem. Don't let Parliament sit in October. Then we get out. Parliament can't stop us getting out. We, we don't, you know, we prorogue. What about that? Uh, Dominic Raab suggested that. Tracy, um, Esther McVeigh was saying the same thing on this programme. I don't think that is the right thing to do. I think that we live in a parliamentary democracy. Mm. Parliament must vote in order to ensure that we leave the European Union. My view is that almost everyone in Parliament voted to trigger Article 50. There are some yeah. honourable exceptions, like Ken Clark. When they voted to trigger Article 50, they voted to say that we are leaving the European Union. MPs must honour that referendum result. But we must also respect the fact that we are a parliamentary democracy. And suspending, or as the constitutional experts call it, proroguing Parliament in order to try to get no deal through, I think would be wrong. Do you think it would be wrong because it would drag the Queen into the centre of this controversy? I think it would be wrong for many reasons. I think it would not be true okay. to the best traditions of British democracy. I argued that we should no. leave the European Union because I wanted us to take back control of our democracy. And that means putting Parliament at the centre of decision making. Now, I took sacrifices in that campaign, made sacrifice, sacrifices in that campaign, in order to secure a restoration of additional powers to Parliament. And I think it is important that we respect that. Now, you, you, you listed the, the, the principles behind your Brexit plan, and I've read them and I've listened to them, and I can't for the life of me see what is really different from what Theresa May tried and failed to do. Well, I would invite you to read it more closely again, Andrew. You're an assiduous reader, but one of I the am. things that I would say is my approach to the backstop is distinctively different, and my approach to free trade is distinctively different. I believe that there is an opportunity for us to deliver uh, an okay. end to the backstop, a full stop to the backstop, and also there's another it's, difference it's as well. It's a matter of belief. Can I, can I just put It's more you than a matter of what, belief. What your it, is a, it is a matter of delivery. I have R proven um, in every job that I've been given against the odds that I but can deliver. You've got the chance to renegotiate all of this. You've got the chance to be the Brexit Secretary and do all these things, and you turned it down. I explained to the Prime Minister that uh, we needed a change of approach. The Prime Minister said uh, yeah. that she wanted to stick to this yeah. approach, and I respected her decision and wanted to be, as I've always wanted to be, part of a team delivering Brexit. Mm. But it is no secret that at different times I said to the Prime Minister, we need a different approach. And I would take a very different approach as Prime Minister. I've shown no. that uh, when I am given the opportunity to deliver, that I'm ready to deliver, so, ready to lead. So you tell us that you can negotiate a different deal. Let me read you Rory Stewart, who may be more straightforward to us with this, on, on all of this. He says, any leadership campaign candidate who is pretending that you're going to go to Brussels and get a different deal simply doesn't understand Brussels, hasn't been following the news, doesn't understand that the European position is very, very clear. And you look at everything that they're saying, both the European leaders and the, uh, the government of which you are part, the British government, have said the negotiations are over. There is no more negotiation of the withdrawal. Simply changing the Prime Minister isn't going to change those facts. Changing the Prime Minister changes everything. We can get a better deal. The European Union is clear. They don't want no deal either. And it is also the case that the European Union know that it would be in everyone's benefits to have a deal that can pass Parliament. And I also know 
from talking to people across Europe that they recognise that change may be required in order to secure a good deal and that I will work with those in Europe and also in our own Parliament to secure a deal that strengthens the United Kingdom, keeps our union strong and also enables us to enjoy the many benefits of Brexit. Um, another big part of your plan is the so-called Stormont lock. You're going to revive Northern Irish politics. Can I put it to you that you are the last person who's going to be able to do that, given your past views? We're talking about your past views. Your past views on the Good Friday Agreement and the Northern Ireland Accord, which were pretty ferocious. No, I think I'm the right person to be able to do that because everybody knows that I'm a unionist okay. to my bootstraps. Um, uh, you know, Andrew, well, that one of the reasons why I'm in politics is to strengthen the United Kingdom. You know that I have been very critical of terrorism and separatism mm. in the past. That means that I'm in a strong position you, 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 to you, command the confidence of the unionists who are our confidence and that, supply partners. That's true, but, but in it terms, is also sorry, the case that of, I have In terms I've of worked, wild language, no, what I've, you said about the peace agreement was the following. You've called it a moral stain, a humiliation of our army, police and parliament, a denial of our national integrity with wickedness at its heart. And that was part of a 17,000 page pamphlet. It wasn't a kind of piece of journalism tossed off, as we all do. It was a really serious piece of thinking, which has not been forgotten in Northern Ireland to this day. I don't think it was 17,000 pages. I think it was a slightly shorter words, work, words, than, words. <laughs> work than that. Yeah. But the, the key thing is, yes, I was critical of some of the ways in which Tony Blair handled the peace process. Yes, I have consistently taken a tough line against terrorism. But it is also the case that we have had now for 20 years, the benefits of peace in Northern Ireland. And in my current job, I have worked effectively with Irish ministers and representatives of the Irish government in order to ensure that the gains of the peace process have been secured. Mm. I've worked hard in Northern Ireland and in the Republic in order to bring people together during the time that I've been in government. And I know that I am ready to deliver a good Brexit deal and also ready to deliver a stronger United Kingdom. You've talked about your use of cocaine. Do you accept that you committed a crime? Uh, it was Yes, it was a crime. It was a mistake. I deeply regret it. Should you have gone to prison? Um, well, I was, I was fortunate in that I didn't, but I do think that it was a profound mistake. And I've seen the damage that drugs do. Um, I've seen it close up, and I've also seen it in the work that I've done as a politician. Mm -hmm. And that's why I deeply regret uh, the mistake that I made. How many times did you take cocaine? I took it several occasions, um, uh, on social occasions, more than 20 years ago, when I was working as a journalist. Was it a habit? No, I don't believe it was. It was a mistake, and it was a mistake that I deeply regret. You were looking at the, the, the dates. You were about 30 at the time. You weren't a young man. You weren't a teenager. Did you have any sense then of the damage that this was doing to other kids on the streets of London, many of whom may be in prison right now? I do have a profound sense of um, uh, regret about it all, and I am very, very aware of the damage that drugs do. Um, as you know, Andrew, I was Justice Secretary. Um, during that time, one of the things I said is that people should never be defined by the worst mm. decision that they made. People should be given a chance to redeem themselves and to change. And I introduced um, efforts uh, to have problem-solving courts so that individuals who uh, may have uh, uh, used drugs had the opportunity to change their lives, to make a contribution. And I'm very, very conscious of the fact that the mistake that I made is not a mistake I would want anyone else to make. Well, the crime that you committed, the maximum sentence for that is seven years in prison and or an unlimited fine. And again, right now, there are people who did what you did who are in prison. And there are lots of uh, kids, basically, who supplied cocaine to people like yourself who have either been stabbed or are in de uh, dead. Cressida Dick, who's head of the Met, said that people like yourself who've used cocaine on social occasions and middle-class parties have blood on their hands. Is she right? Um, I hugely respect Cressida Dick. And one of the things that I would absolutely say is that it is a mistake which I profoundly regret, mm. absolutely. And one of the things that I also completely agree with is that the drug trade is wrong, that drugs wreck lives. And that's one of the reasons why I have sought in office to try to, uh, to help people to move away from that. Look, I'm very conscious of the fact that I was fortunate. I'm very mm. conscious of the fact that I've been blessed throughout life in many respects, conscious that right from the moment that I was adopted, that um, I, I've had good fortune. And it's because I know how fragile uh, good fortune can be, and because I know about human frailty, um, that I am committed in politics mm. to helping everyone I can. I believe that every life is precious mm. and that everyone has worth and that whatever people have done in the past, we should look mm. for the treasure in the heart of every man and try to give okay. people the chance to make a contribution. When you became a minister, did you 
tell the government that you had taken Class A drugs? Did you mm. put it on the form when you were uh, tested? No one asked. I don't believe that um, uh, it, the question was ever raised. No, not on the vetting form? Not that I, I don't ever remember being asked okay. in any way about that. Uh, including on the ESTA form for travel to the United States? I don't believe that... They, they do ask that question. Have you used Class A drugs? I don't believe that I've ever on any occasion um, uh, failed to tell the truth about this when asked directly. And one of the things... But it would be on the form. I mean, you would have to say yes or no. And if you'd said yes, you could be banned for life from entering the United States. I think it is the case that um, uh, if I were elected the Prime Minister of this country, then, of course, it would be the case that I would be able to go to the United States. And I think that uh, well, uh, it's, it's foolish to suggest otherwise. Let's, let's look at an, another job that you did, which was Education Secretary. On Thank your you. watch, as I understand it, any teacher caught with Class A drugs could be suspended as teacher for life. Is that true? Well, I, I wouldn't want to get into individual cases. But no, I'm not I said, asking. I'm asking about the no, principle. No, no. But, but uh, uh, as I say, you know, the, it, it mm. is the case. We would be talking there about people who were using it in the course of their professional life. Um, uh, I made a mistake. I believe that uh, now, um, uh, as I've explained to you, Andrew... Just, people... did, you, did you bring that rule change in? No, I don't believe so, no. Um, I think one of the things that um, I did do as Education Secretary uh, is to do everything possible in order mm. to attract the widest range of people into teaching. We improved education during the time I was Education Secretary. 1.9 million more children are in good and outstanding schools mm. as a result of what I did. And one of the things which but Esther you... McVeigh said earlier, with which I profoundly agree, is, um, of course, uh, the decisions that we make in the past mm. we should be held accountable for. But in this election, what we are reflecting on is who has the ideas, the vision, the experience okay. in office to be able to lead in the future. And I'm ready to lead on day one. You have been accused on the front page of newspapers today of hypocrisy about this. And when one reads the article that you wrote at the time, that's a fair charge, is it not? No, I think anyone can read the article and can make their own minds up. The point that I made in the article is that um, uh, if any of us mm. lapse sometimes, Andrew, from, from uh, standards that we uphold, mm. that is human. Uh, the thing to do is not necessarily then to say that the standards should be lowered. It should be to reflect on the lapse it's, and to seek to do better in future. It's just that a lot of people watching, thinking about the condition of teachers who mm. are caught with Class A drugs, or people who are not in your fortunate position, or my unfortunate position, yeah. or whatever it might be, and what happens to them might feel this is one law and one standard for people at the top of the tree, like yourself, and a different one for everybody else. I quite understand. And as I say, I was fortunate at the time. I wasn't mm. a politician um, at the time, but it was wrong. And I think that uh, in office, what I have shown is a determination to help people, uh, whatever their background, including um, at education and justice, who may have been born into lives of disadvantage, to lead better lives. And one of the reasons why I want to be prime minister is I value every individual. I think everyone has a contribution to make. And I want everyone to become author okay. of their own life story, to be able to determine their own fate and make a contribution. All right, let's, let's turn to um, something else that you said in the not-too-distant past when you were describing Boris Johnson at the time of the last leadership mm. contest, and you said he didn't have the grip, he didn't have the focus, he, effectively he didn't have the character for the top job. Have you changed your view on that? Well, I'm a, uh, uh, I like Boris very much, and I enjoyed working with him. But uh, when Boris comes on your programme, as I hope he will, you can ask him about his plans and his vision. I'm here to talk about it's, my it's plans just, again, and I'm, my vision. I'm sorry vision. to interrupt, but for, no, pe no, no, for, no, pe no, for, no. People, for people watching, you know, um, they might well have Boris Johnson or yourself as their next Prime Minister. Mm. This is a matter of real public moment. What kind of character is, could he cope with the top job? You have said in the past, no, effectively, he couldn't. And I'm asking you, as somebody who has observed him as Foreign Secretary, who's known him for a long time, have you changed your mind about that or not? I'm not going to talk about any of the other candidates. You will have a chance to interview them. The public will have a chance to see them, I okay. hope, on the BBC's television debate next week. Which and you people... will come to. Oh, of course. And I hope every candidate does. Because we saw in the 2017 mm. general right. election, when we didn't participate at the highest level in television debates, and we didn't subject ourselves to that scrutiny, that was an error. I hope all the candidates will. And I will have an opportunity to outline my economic plan that puts business at the heart of the revival of Britain and that and will reform taxation and regulation in order to generate wealth, 
particularly there's, for the most disadvantaged parts of the United Kingdom. There's a very strange sort of vestigial announcement this morning from your campaign, which is that you're going to get rid of VAT, which raises £139 billion. It's a huge, huge yes. tax, 6% of the entire economy, and replace it with a sales tax. Yes. What sales tax, at what rate, and when will we know? Well, one of the things I'd want to do in an early budget and an early comprehensive spending review is to look to see how we can have a tax regime which is as most pro-business in the world. And one okay. of the ways we can do That's, that is getting okay. rid of the bureaucratic model of Michael. VAT to a much more flexible and lower tax regime. We've run out of time. Michael Gove, thanks very much indeed for talking to us. That's all for this week. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.